Good morning, everybody. How about we all stand together and start this beautiful morning out with some music. We're going to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. change just to spring something quickly on you um, our next hymn is going to be I am the light of the world uh, verses 2 and 4 and that's 469 if you are reading in the hymnal
Thank you for bringing us in this morning. We appreciate that. And it's good to, uh, to see you folks that have uh, gathered here with us this morning. And welcome also to you who are joining us uh, online. Uh, looks like our online crowd is pretty big today. Um, so uh, we, uh, we welcome all of you. We're glad that you're a part of the family today. The uh, church announcements for our uh, church life together are included in your order of worship. Um, just a couple of them there. Just um, that worship is uh, uh, in live and, and online uh, the next couple of Sundays. Um, coming up in two weeks will be um, November the 7th. Uh, not only is that uh, Backpack Meals Day, um, that's also Set Your Clocks uh, Back one hour fall back so if you don't do that then you'll be here early and that's okay we've got stuff for you to do if you get here an hour early that'll that'll work out fine so take a moment uh turn around to those uh who are around you um and wave to your neighbor one day we'll soon be able to to get back into to, um seeing one another and now if you haven't noticed right off uh, sitting up front here today is uh, it's Noah Collins, right? Noah Collins, okay, and, and a former music director here at the church uh, in town uh, this weekend, and so we're glad to have him back in the in the Northwest and and out of Los Angeles for a while. So welcome, glad that you're here as well. We'll continue now in our time of worship. Uh, together, we are um, working our way through the uh, letter to the Hebrews, and today we are in the seventh chapter, uh, beginning with the 23rd verse. This is the Word of God. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save for all time those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. And this ends our reading from God's holy word. May he add his blessings to our hearing and reading of that word. Mark Sandstrom was a classmate of mine at Northwest Christian College, now Bushnell University. He was a part of the Southern California contingent, large number of students who came up from the Los Angeles area to go to school there, and when he graduated, he went back to the South. He went back to Southern California, went to seminary at Claremont University. We were good friends, and we kept in touch a little bit uh, over the years, mostly through social media when that was uh, invented, shared what was going on in our congregations from time to time. Yet a few years ago, Mark died of cancer at the relatively young age of 55. And to paraphrase our author from Hebrews, death prevented him from continuing in office. Mark's untimely death 
and caused the Church of the Valley in Van Nuys, California, the church he had so faithfully served, to need to search for new leadership, to find a new pastor. Yet even if a church's pastor doesn't die while serving their congregation, eventually all churches have to find a new pastor because pastors not only die, we also retire or move to another parish or move into other areas of service and ministry. Of course, that's not just a problem for the church. As Hebrews 7 points out, there were numerous problems within Judaism with both priests and the priesthood. In verse 23, the author makes it plain. He says, the former priests were many in number. In fact, one historian counted 83 high priests from the time of Aaron, brother of Moses, to the end of the second temple in A.D. 70, or a new high priest on the average of every 15 and a half years. Of course, when the Romans destroyed the temple in 70, they also destroyed sacrificial worship in the temple, thus effectively killing the party of the Sadducees and the priesthood in general. Judaism moved its locus from the temple and sacrifice to the synagogue and prayer and scripture reading and almsgiving. And that's when the party of the Pharisees evolved into what we know today as rabbinic Judaism or the rabbis. You may have wondered why we don't see Sadducees anymore. So on top of being mortal, Judaism's priests were also spiritually fragile. So they had to repeatedly perform sacrifices day after day, week after week, year after year, as long as they lived. Because we know that even the best of human beings fail every day. Faith weakens. Faithfulness deteriorates. Today's sins overwhelm yesterday's sacrifices and offerings. So Israel's aging priests had to trudge back to the sanctuary in an endless cycle of sin and sacrifice, not just on behalf of those that they served, but also for themselves. In fact, Apparently, the very first offering offered each morning at the altar was for the priest's own sins. And that was a problem, especially in the light of the demise of the temple. And that's where our book of Hebrews comes in. The argument that the author makes is quite complex. So let me try and summarize it for you quickly. Priests within Judaism must be from the tribe of Levi. But as the Messiah, Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. That is, he was of the house and lineage of David. Thus, Jesus could not be a traditional Jewish priest. However, this is where our old buddy Melchizedek, you remember Melchizedek, this is where he comes in, the Messianic prophecy from Psalm 110. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This provides Jesus as Messiah a way to be a priest, indeed a priest forever. And that last point becomes the basis then for the contrast between Jesus' eternal priesthood versus the limited priesthood of earthly priests. So, our author says, God's people no longer have to go out and find a goat, or a chicken, or a hamster, or anything else to offer so that someone can sacrifice it on our behalf. You and I no longer have to get, sacrifice something of ourselves to make God happy with us. God has given us in Jesus Christ a new kind of access to God. 
a direct access, no longer beholding to the priesthood as a kind of gatekeeper for heaven. In fact, that's how the priesthood became so corrupt. They used that power over sacrifice to enhance and enrich themselves and not as servants of the people. The system of sacrifice got extremely elaborate. So it was then that not just any animal would do, but the animal had to be without blemish. That is, the best of the lot. And the grain offerings had to be the best. The wine offerings, the prime vintage. And the mystery behind that comes into real sharp focus when we remember that everything that was offered in the temple as sacrificed had to be consumed by the priests when that was finished. Rabbi Rick Eisenberg, a friend of mine from my days in Columbus, Georgia, always said to me, anytime you see in the scripture burnt offering, you can just read that as barbecue. So Jesus trudged through the muck and the mire of human life and experienced nearly every test, underwent almost every trial, and endured virtually every temptation people have ever experienced. And yet Jesus emerged from it not defeated, but perfect. Not disobedient, but obedient. He remained faithful in a way that no human has ever been or ever will be again. And he did that, says our author, once for all. And that is the key to the passage. But also the problem for us as human beings. Because like the priests of Judaism, we so want to be the gatekeepers of God's kingdom. In every commentary I read on this text this week, that statement, once for all, was qualified. One wrote, once for all who come to God in faith. Another wrote, once for all who confess Jesus as Lord. Now, I'm sure while an argument can be made for those additional qualifications, our author does not add them. That's the only thing. The author does not add them. No conditions, no additions, just inclusion. Once for all. But God bless us. We just can't refrain from gatekeeping. It was not long into our journey as the Christian church that we began setting up obstacles for people coming to God. The creeds that state what one must believe. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. The Inquisition that made people confess on pain of death and so on. Until, by the time we got to the 16th century, the priesthood had become so corrupt that a German monk, Martin Luther, started what we call the Reformation. Next Sunday, October 31st, is Reformation Sunday, when we remember, again, trying to get back to basics. But still, we insist on exclusion rather than inclusion. And the examples are myriad. Let me give you a few. Churches that only accept the King James Bible, version of the Bible. I've seen it right on their sign. You may have too, or on their building. King James Version only. It's weird to me that they would make the test of faith a translation of the Bible that was based on a faulty Greek manuscript. Then there are churches and seminaries that require faculty, staff, laity to sign statements of belief. And lots of other ways we say who is in and who is out. What is Christian and what is not. Who Jesus cares for and who is damned. Once for all. That's why God's sons and daughters, thank God, that Jesus always lives to intercede for us. Jesus' sacrifice 
saves you and me completely, once and for all. Yet He is still working to remind us of that because we need the reminders. Rebel, heretic, a thing to flout. You drew a circle that shut me out. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took you in. So all of you with ears to hear, let them hear. It is our time to go into prayer now. We uh, sing our prayer hymn today, Amazing Grace. If uh, there is someone that you would uh, like to add to our list of prayers, I invite you to take one of the uh, prayer cards in the pew pockets in front of you there and uh, fill that out. Uh, if you're watching at home, I uh, invite you to go ahead and send us those names through our Facebook uh, Facebook app, and uh, we'll get those as well as we sing together Amazing Grace. We have had a number of uh, folks uh, write in and, and uh, over Facebook and so forth, so I do want to share those. Um, coming from Texas, um, we asked uh, for prayers uh, for Lexi uh, Wagner, um, her upcoming surgery. Do we know when it's upcoming? We just know it's upcoming. A few months after. Okay, so we do want to remember uh, Lexi and and uh, and all of the hospital folks down there. Uh, also, a friend of ours, and you may know her too, Brenda Nagel, um, is in the hospital and now on comfort care. Um, we're not expecting her uh, to go very much further. Um, and uh, then we've had a request, uh, prayers for uh, Joni and Chuck. Uh, for travels and for health, uh, remember them, and uh, for our friend Heather, uh, and also Patty, um, her blood pressure is uh, must be down now, so she's out of the hospital now. So she's doing a little better, Patty? Okay, good. Uh, and let me also, someone reminded me, you know, I say to look at your, your prayer requests on your um, order of worship, but I don't often share those, so folks at home, um, we do want to remember uh, Carrie Beebe, uh, Carol Baxter, uh, Isaac Phillips, uh, Lexi, who we just mentioned, uh, anybody uh, suffering and working through addiction, and of course those impacted by COVID-19. So we want to uh, remember all of those people 
and, uh, and remember them in our prayers. So let's take a few moments now in silence, and then we will pray together. Let us bow. How grateful we are, Holy One, that Jesus lives and intercedes for us day by day. We confess that sometimes we kind of sleepwalk through our lives, not always conscious of the wonderful things you have done for us, not always remembering that you gave your very life on our behalf. Forgive us the times when we forget and help us to be mindful. We remember that it is not just for us and not just for our friends or our acquaintances, but that you sent Christ for all. Because you love everyone, we ought also love everyone. Forgive us when we forget that. Forgive us when we become angry, short-tempered, when we become forgetful or a little bit peevish. And help us to always remember that we are alike a part of the kingdom of God. And so now, watch over us. Bless us. Raise us up. Making us into the people that you would have us to be. As we join our voices and our hearts in saying the prayer that you taught us so long ago. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so we come to the table. We come to the table of God's grace where all who feel called, all who feel drawn are welcome as we sing our communion hymn, Give Thanks.
Lord, I have not been in this church for a while because of a multitude of things that are kind of just hindrances. I think that sometimes, Lord, we just kind of try to make things work and we kind of overlook what really matters. At least I do. And we're we're always welcome to be with God. And sometimes I know that I get too interested in other things and not so much in God. Help me, Father, to become someone that I can be for you. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And you are welcome at the feast. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus ter- first took the bread, and when he gave thanks for it, he broke it and he passed it among them, saying, This is my body. It is broken for you. Take it, all of you, and eat. And then in the same manner, he took also the cup, and when he had given thanks for it, he passed it among them saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many the forgiveness of sin. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as we share this cup and share this bread, we proclaim Christ resurrected until he comes again. Would you join me in prayer? We love because you first loved us. We share with one another the gifts that you have given to us. As we have shared at the table, we have also given some of the many blessings that you have Pass to us. So bless now these tithes and these offerings that they may be used 
that they may be magnified, that they may be a great balm to the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I invite you to jo join me, stand, for our closing blessing. And now, Holy One, send us out. Lead us to be salt in a world that has lost its flavor. Make us into your light for the dark places where we live. This is not easy work, but because we have met you here, we are more ready than we realize. Bless us to be a blessing to those we will meet this week. In the power of Jesus' name, we pray and seek to live. Amen. Now let us close with This is the Day. This is the day. children say amen.